we've got another long one today, so keep that in mind if you've just pressed play. This will be the model for any future sections that have lots of clauses to go over. All right, let's rock this thing. Article 1, Section 3 of the U.S. Constitution. Complete text. The Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state, chosen by the legislature thereof, for six years, and each senator shall have one vote. Immediately after, they shall be assembled in consequence of the first election. They shall be divided as equally as may be into three classes. The sentence of the senators of the first class shall be vacated at the expiration of the second year, of the second class at the expiration of the fourth year, and of the third class at the expiration of the sixth year. So that one third may be chosen every second year, and if vacancies happen by resignation or otherwise, during the recess of the legislature of any state, the executive thereof, may make temporary appointments until the next meeting of the legislature, which shall then fill such vacancies. No person shall be a senator who shall not have attained to the age of 30 years and been nine years a citizen of the United States and who shall not, when elected, be an inhabitant of the state for which he shall be chosen. The vice president of the United States shall be president of the Senate, but shall have no vote unless they be equally divided. The Senate shall choose their officers and also a president pro tempore in the absence of the vice president or when he shall exercise the office of president of the United States. The Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments when sitting for that purpose. They shall be on oath or affirmation. When the president of the United States is tried, the chief justice shall preside and no person shall be convicted without the concurrence of two thirds of the members of present. Judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than to removal from office and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. But the party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to law. Whew, all right, here we go. Clause 1. In one simple sentence, the Constitution declared the length of a term for a senator and how they'd be apportioned amongst the states. That's to each state. We sort of take this for granted now that this is just the way it is, but there was a lot of back and forth. On one side, you had people wanting the Senate to be apportioned by population, and on the other, evenly distributed. The by population group was all for it because it was more representative of the people at large. But the even amounts per state folks didn't want population centers to have excessive power over other states. Remember, states each have their own governments, and if places like California had high representation in both the House and Senate, they'd be deciding laws that could have huge influence on how Rhode Island does their you know, state government, for instance. The end result of the debate was to have both, leaving the House as apportioned by population and the Senate apportioned evenly to strike a balance between national governmental power, which is by the people, and federation-type governments, which is by states. Key bit of information here, the Senate was originally determined by state legislatures, as per the text, slicing off the Senate entirely from that kind of people representation that the House has, clearly making a divide between the two. An amendment will later change that to be voted by the people, as it is today, but we'll get there in another video. Clause 2. This one is interesting to me, to both create an ability for change while maintaining stability. You have the Senate votes every two years, but only roughly one third of the Senate can be swapped out each two year time period. I think this is an interesting and good way of mixing the benefits of stability, where you might have someone with seniority or people who stay in the Senate over again and again and again, and still accessing potential flexibility to represent the people of today. That six year position ended up being a consistency thing, just choosing six years, to match it up with state Senate terms at the time. Senators who resigned or vacancies that arose otherwise would also be temporarily filled by the state's executive branch. That has also changed since the 17th Amendment came into place, but again, we'll get into that in another video. Clause three. Similar to the requirements for House of Representatives, these Qualifications were determined to be unchangeable by any state or other body. In addition, the requirements are higher, even if only slightly, which the founders argued were because of the trust placed in the Senate and the maturity required, which you might think hasn't worked out as intended. Clause 4. 
This is what I would call a convenience clause. It helped by removing any need for the Senate to elect a president or determine how to do that, and that was actually a big selling point on this clause. It also put some power in the vice president's hand, which having a vice president was decided pretty late in the making of the Constitution, when otherwise there isn't a lot of power that the vice president has. So it was a win-win for ease of implementation. Clause 5. Just like with the House, the Senate can determine all other officer positions and how they get the position. Also, this created an option for if there wasn't a vice president at the time, so you know who fills in. Well, the Senate basically picks somebody. Clause 6. The House gets to determine if someone will be impeached, but what this is saying is the Senate then tries that person. There were thoughts about the Supreme Court doing this originally, but because many justice, justices can only be removed due to impeachment, this was problematic since they would be sitting over their own potential impeachments, right? Along with the fact that many of them would be appointed by a president, which partially removes that check on power should the president be impeached, right? Because you might want to do them a favor for getting you your job or something similar. They also smartly took the vice president's position of presiding over the Senate into account as well, and in cases of presidential impeachment, shifting that power to the chief justice to remove the vice president from presiding over a situation that could directly lead to their own elevation to being president. Whew, such a small sentence, but there's a lot in there. Clause 7. The last clause for this section. There is really just things about limiting the results of an impeachment trial in here and what those can be, while also not limiting what can happen outside of the trial. The Senate can determine that the person should be removed from their office and whether or not that disqualifies them from any office in the U.S. later, but it doesn't determine what, if any, legal charges might be brought. Nor does impeachment have to happen first for those criminal proceedings to occur or even for them to be found guilty of the criminal proceedings. It's completely separate. It's unclear even if the impeachment has to remove the person from office in order to vote on never holding office again. Those have been held separate in the past, but there's still debate on if they have to go together. In fact, it even happened in the impeachment trials for Donald Trump, whether or not he could be, you know, found perfectly fine for the keeping in the office, but then still held against uh, any future office in the future. Um, so those things are still a modern debate. And we're done. One of the things I'm finding super fascinating about this process is how it feels like nearly everything has all these specific nuances in law today. Subpoints upon subpoints upon subpoints. But that this document is very much left open to interpretation from a group of people who didn't all agree at the time, and yet it still sparks conversation today about these points. I look forward to finishing this trip to the U.S. Constitution and hopefully the conversations that will be spawned once we get into the amendments that can get really tricky. This video is brought to you by Caffeine Zombies. Coffee's so good, it'll wake the dead.